Nibiru in ancient Babylon? Wait a, wait a second. I thought Zachariah Sitchin made up Nibiru and, and the Anunnaki, right? No, wrong. The Anunnaki and Nibiru have been referenced for thousands of years. Actually, Nibiru is referred to in tablet number seven, the creation story that Genesis has many underpinnings to. It's actually far older than the Old Testament. Well, in this tablet, Nibiru is referred to as the Caesar of the midst, as well as the shepherd of the gods. Very powerful. Marduk seems to adopt the title as well. Marduk usurps up the gods throughout the tablets. This is tablet seven that I'm going to share with you today. We're going to read tablet seven in full, but I just wanted to let you know I took notes even because I think that this is pretty important. Did Zachariah Sitchin invent the Anunnaki and the Nibiru myth? No, he didn't. So we'll just, we'll put no there and I'll, I'll give you verif uh, verifiable evidence in a moment. So I want to also look at SIL VA243. We're going to analyze this specific SIL because this SIL shows either planet X or it could be representation of Betelgeuse and the Pleiades star system and other star systems that are orbiting, at least from our perception, thousands of years ago. I'm going to let you decide on that. Then we're going to get into where the Anunnaki came from. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the difference between the Anunnaki and the gods because they are specifically different. They are referred to as two completely different things in some of these texts. Oftentimes they will get merged together. And then what is the situation with Marduk? How did Marduk usurp up all of the gods and get the, the earth to turn over its sovereignty to that deity? Quite interesting, right? And also, I wanted to thank my friends over at Noble Gold. So I've got a great relationship with Noble Gold Investments, and they're giving free books to Leak Project listeners right now. Do you want more gold? Who doesn't want more gold? Even the Anunnaki wanted more gold, right? Well, here's your opportunity. Click the link, read the free books. They're going to show you how to get more gold. It's pretty cool. How to actually have precious metals in your hands. So click the links. Let them know Leak Project sent you. It's really a great, quick read. There's several books that you can read that'll show you, okay, this is the opportunity that I'm missing. Let's take advantage of that opportunity. Noble Gold Investments, click the link. You'll be glad you did. Now, I'm going to show you, we're going to go to the tablet here. Let me pull this up. Where are we at here? Yep, Tablets of Creation. Bingo. This is right here. If you see the homage of mankind to Marduk, this is tablet number seven. This was translated in the mid-1800s. This was translated in the mid-1800s. And the, the tablets themselves are estimated to be at least 4,000 years old. At least 4,000 years old. Um, I also, let me do this real quick because I wanted to share with you the, this is the cuneiform tablet that Mr. Sitchin deciphered. Let me show this to you in reference to the Nibiru hypothesis. You see that star right there with all the planets around it? Is that our sun and 10 planets around the sun? Well, where's planet X? Well, this gentleman, Carl, uh, the, the website is K-A-R-E-L-D-O-N-K.com, blog.caroldonk.com. Very intelligent. I got to get this guy on the show because the information that he put together analyzing uh, to, best, you know, to, to the best of his knowledge, the size of these planets, the size in conjunction with our planets in the solar system, uh, deciphering whether or not this is actually showing planet X and our planets at that particular time with the sun in the center. He even numbers it out. So you can see he, he, he levels everything out with numbers. And then he does a bunch of math that I didn't 
calculate yet, so I haven't had a chance to do the math. But with the math that he has done, it seems to be pretty compelling that this could actually be showing our solar system at that time. So I, I just don't understand why some people seem to give him more trouble and, and a hard time than, than they really should because he was a scholar. I don't know if you know of anybody that's right 100% of the time. I certainly don't know of anybody that's right 100% of the time. I don't agree with him on 100% of his work either. And I've, I haven't even read 100% of his works. The work that I have read, I don't agree with it 100%. However, I could be wrong. And then when I read these ancient texts that describe Nibiru, the Caesar of the mist, the conqueror of Tiamat, a god that is so powerful that it usurps up the other gods to give their control over to this, to this entity, Nibiru, right here. This is it. So this tablet, you can go to the British Museum and you can look at the tablet yourself and it specifically states Nibiru, the Caesar of the mist. And then right here, this is the transliteration. You can see this isn't in English. There's Nibiru right there. Nibiru, creation series, tablet number seven. See, I've got an open enough mind to take information and cross-reference it with other variables and not stay underneath an umbrella of people that say, well, you know, I study a particular path and, and I'm not going to, first of all, I, I love everybody's mind if they're searching for the truth and they're looking for information. What I don't like is to see people get to the point of they, they hit that brick wall because they think they know everything. And then you have a conversation with them and they're not going to look at anything else that doesn't fit their criteria because it doesn't feel right, because it might change the paradigm of what they've learned. And people seem to be oftentimes either stuck in the electric universe hypothesis or the ancient alien hypothesis. Well, why can't it be both? There's, I mean, that's what I don't understand. I mean, it's like the separation again. You can get very solid data on both accounts. So let's go ahead and read this. I'm going to read tablet seven from the beginning here. Let's scroll up. Where are we at? No, we've still got a few more to go up here. Stand by. We're almost there. Okay, here we go. The seventh tablet. The seventh tablet. And first of all, I, I want to make sure that my uh, my audio is coming in good here. So let's do a double take. I mean, what if Sitchin was right? You know, there's that website where, oh, Sitchin is wrong. What if he's right? I mean, my goodness, that's that's what's scarier if he's wrong or if he's right. <laughs> Interesting. Let's check out the audio. How's the audio? Are we good? All right, cool. The seventh tablet. Hold on, I'm gonna drink. You drink a coffee here. Mm, that's the spot. I used to, you know, I used to have to get two. I used to have to get a, a refill. You know, a cup of coffee and a refill during the show. Now I can just fill up one coffee cup and I'm good to go. All right, let's rock and roll here. The seventh tablet, oh, Asari, bestower of planting, founder of sowing, creator of grain and plants, who caused the green herb to spring up. Oh, Asaru Alam, who was revered in the house of council, who aboundeth in council. The gods paid homage. Fear took hold upon them. Oh, Asaru Alam Nuna the mighty one, the light of the father who begot him, who directeth the decrees of Anu, Bel, and Ea. He was their patron. He ordained there. He whose provision is abundance goeth forth. To two is he who created them anew. Should their wants be pure, then are they satisfied. 
Should he make an incantation, then are the gods appeased. Should they attack him in anger, he withstandeth their onslaught. Let him therefore be exalted, and the assembly of the gods let him. None among the gods can rival him. Tutu is Ziukina, the life of the host of the gods, who established for the gods the bright heavens. He set them on their way and ordained their path. Never shall his deeds be forgotten among men. Tutu, as Ziazog, thirdly they named, the bringer of purification, the God of the favoring breeze, the Lord of hearing and mercy, the creator of fullness and abundance, the founder of plenteousness, who increaseth all that is small, in sore distress, we felt his favoring breeze. Let them say, let them pay reverence. Let them bow in humility before him. To two, as Aga Azag, may mankind fourthly magnify the Lord of the pure incantation, the quickener of the dead, who had mercy upon the captive gods, who removed the yoke from upon the gods, his enemies. For their forgiveness did he create mankind, the merciful one, with whom it is to bestow life. May his deeds endure, may they never be forgotten. In the mouth of mankind, whom his hands have made, Tutu as Muaza, fifthly his pure incantation, may their mouth proclaim, who through his pure incantation hath destroyed all the evil ones. Sogzu who knoweth the heart of the gods, who seeth through the innermost heart. The evildoer, he hath not cause to go forth with him, founder of the assembly of the gods, who, their heart, subduer of the disobedient, director of righteousness, who, rebellion and. Tutu as Zisi the who put an end to anger, who? Tutu as Sir Kerr, thirdly, the destroyer of the foe, who put their plans to confusion, who destroyed all the wicked, let them. He named the four quarters of the world, mankind he created, and upon him understanding, Tiamat, distant may. Let's stop for a minute. So, he named the four quarters of the world, Northeast, Southwest, right? Northeast, Southwest. Some people have taken that. And if you read through scriptures, they think the shape of the earth is squarish. It's talking about the compass, Northeast, Southwest, in my opinion. So, like I said, the earth is earth-shaped. Problem solved. It's shaped like the earth. So he named the four quarters of the world. Mankind he created and upon him understanding. Tiamat, distance. Tiamat, distant, may. The mighty one, Agi, the creator of the earth. Zulumu, the giver of counsel and of whatsoever. Mumu, the creator of. Mulul, the heavens. Who for? Giskul, let. Who brought the gods to naught. Lugalab, who in? Pop, who in? Obviously, a lot of that is missing. So it'd be nice if we could get the full version of it. I'd like to know some of those names and creators. The chief. Of all lords, supreme is his might. Lugal, Derma, the king of the band of the gods, the lord of rulers, who is exalted in a royal habitation, who among the gods is gloriously supreme. Adu, Nuna, the counselor of Ea, who created the gods, his fathers, unto the path of whose majesty no god can ever attain. In Dulazog, he made it known, pure is his dwelling, the, of those without. Understanding is Lugal, Dulazaga, 
Supreme is his might. There in the midst of Tiamat, of the battle, him, the star which shineth in the heavens, may he hold the beginning and the future. May they pay homage unto him. Saying he who forced his way through the mist of Tiamat without resting. Let it, his name be Nibiru. Let his name be Nibiru, the Caesar of the mist. For the stars of heaven he upheld the paths. He shepherded all the gods like sheep. He conquered Tiamat. He troubled and ended her life. In the future of mankind, when the days grow old, may this be heard without ceasing, may it hold sway forever. Since he created the realm of heaven and fashioned the firm earth. Let's take a, a moment here and scroll back to line. Now, just so you see, the reason I'm scrolling through these one pages so fast is because this is the transliteration. I do not speak ancient Sumerian yet. I mean, I kind of do. Some of the, you know, the, the names of the gods, I'm, I'm getting a little bit better. I mean, we could try. Sumsulu, Nibiru, Ahizu, Kurbisu, Sa, Kakakabani, Samami, Alkatsunu, Lakililu. See, I mean, I'm working on it. But do you see that word right there? There's Nibiru. And that's not in English. That is the direct transliteration from the cuneiform tablet. Nibiru, Nibiru, there it is. And Nibiru, let's go back here. Let's start 106. There's some, some of this is missing. The star which shineth in the heavens. So they're seeing, they're seeing this planet, this massive planet. It's okay. The star which shineth in the heavens, may he hold the beginning and the future. May they pay homage unto him, saying, he who forced his way through the mist of Tiamat without resting. Let his name be Nibiru, the Caesar of the mist. For the stars of heaven, he upheld the paths. He shepherded all the gods like sheep. He conquered Tiamat. He troubled and ended her life. In the future of mankind, when the days grow old, may this be heard without ceasing. May it hold sway forever, since he created the realm of heaven and fashioned the firm earth. The Lord of the world, the Father, Bel, hath called his name. This title, which all the spirits of heaven proclaimed, did Ea hear this, or did, he, did Ea hear, and his spirit was rejoiced, and he said, He whose name his fathers have made glorious shall be even as I. His name shall be Ea. The binding of all my decrees shall be, shall he control all my commands, shall he make known. By the name of 50 did the great gods proclaim his 50 names they made his path preeminent epilogue let them be held in remembrance and let the first man proclaim them let the wise and the understanding consider them together let the father repeat them and teach them to his son let them be in the ears of the pastor and the shepherd let a man rejoice in Marduk, the Lord of the gods, that he may cause his land to be fruitful and that he himself may have prosperity. His word standeth fast. His command is unaltered. The utterance of his mouth hath no God ever annulled. He gazed in his anger. He turned not his neck. When he is wroth, no God can withstand his Indignation. Wide is his heart, broad is his compassion. The sinner and the evildoer in his presence, they received instruction, they spake before him unto. Of Marduk, may the gods, may they his name, they took and. And that is 
the end of Tablet 7. Now, here's what's interesting is there are many creation stories that have similar underpinnings with different names, with different names. And that makes me question, well, I'll give you an example. When I was growing up during the summer, I would go hang out with my cousins and um, my, <laughs> my cousins would, um, they were always competing, right? So, so Dustin would, I remember he, he, you know, used to have, used to have tape recorders, right? Where you could leave recordings of things. And that used to be considered cool. Well, I remember listening to this story that he put together where he was kind of joking around on tape, kind of how he looked at himself in a sense, I guess. And then his younger brother, my other cousin, Tyler, did something similar. He had a very similar story. And it's like he heard what Dustin said, and then he, he, he like copied it. And um, I, I'm wondering if some of these, these battles that took place in the past, you know, some of these kingships that transferred power, et cetera, the king would say, hey, I want you to take that story and take out a few names and, and replace those names with my names. And there's so much we don't understand about ancient history and Mesopotamia and Samaria and Babylon, some of these titles and some of these names that are referred to as titles. To understand the dialect is key. And another very interesting thing is, oh, I need to show you this also because I forgot to I forgot to bring this up on the, uh, wow, there's not that many people in here. Thought there'd be in, in, interesting. Okay, well, I, guess, I guess I need to start doing stuff on other topics because we don't have a whole lot of people in here. Anyway, but everyone that's in here is awesome. So this is kind of a, uh, we'll look at this as advanced level classes right now. This is advanced level stuff. So. I'm looking at Marduk, right? I'm, I'm looking for Marduk in history as a king. There are plenty of temples as uh, Marduk being the, the center, the focal point of worship. And I also found the, the temple of Nippur or Nippur. And I want to show this to you because this is where specifically in some of these tablets, the gods got together and talked about stuff and made things happen, you know, the fates of others, etc. So this is it. This is in, uh, in the Middle East. Let me show this to you right now. I forgot to show it on the other one. I just had it on the, the thumbnail. So Nippur, Nippur in Akkadian was among the most ancient of Sumerian cities. It was the special seat of the worship of the Sumerian god Enlil, the lord of wind, ruler of the cosmos, subject to On alone. Nippur was located in modern Nufar in Afak al Quasimnirzgram, Governor Date in Iraq. Probably said that wrong. Hello, but this is it. This is it. And you can, uh, the, the house of the holies, the house of the gods, uh, you know, like the, the Roman pantheon, the Greek pantheon, the Sumerian pantheon, the Egyptian pantheon all had a house of worship. And what's interesting is in Tablet 5, it describes how Marduk created the temple of Nippur for the study of the stars, essentially, the study of the constellations and the planets. So it wasn't just a place of worship. I mean, this was a place of science and astronomy and incredible feats of you know, just things that are way beyond what modern academia oftentimes is letting people believe. At least that's in my opinion. So what's your opinion? What's your opinion? And uh, let his name be Nibiru, the Caesar of the mist. Yeah, now let's look at this. Now I want to, I want to go back to this for a second. So let's go back to the, the Zachariah Sitchin hypothesis of Nibiru. And uh, based upon certain sills and translations. So the sill VA243 
according to this Wikipedia link, is you are his servant, which is now thought to be a message from a nobleman to a servant. Now, you've all heard of, of Mr. Heiser, and I respect Mr. Heiser as well. Um, I, I certainly don't um, agree with everything he says either, but I'm sure he doesn't agree with everything I say. And my goodness, is there anybody out there that agrees with everything everybody says? I hope not, because iron sharpens iron. So it's good to have an open mind. It's good to um, look for the truth. You know, if you're looking for the truth, it may take you a while to get there, but the journey is exciting. The journey is exciting. If you can get there without um, knocking on other people's work, I think, in my opinion, that's the best thing to do because everybody or most people can bring something very positive to contribute. Most people, not always, not always, but most of the time. So this was the specific sill uh, being referred to. And then this website, once again, you got to check this website out. Great. How this person took the data here of this tablet, took the size of these areas that look like planets around the star and was able to do the math. And these are the figures that he put together. He even puts together... You can see right here, he's basing it upon, I mean, you're, you're going to have to read this yourself. But what I find interesting is this one right here, he's able to put names on the planets around the sun. You can see specifically they're all there. So I think that that is great. I got to say props to you, man, for putting that together, especially if your math is, is accurate. Because that right there shows that there was a 10th planet in our solar system. Now, this is another website that I found called mythology.stackexchange.com. It's kind of like a blog forum, you know. So I found this in reference to that tablet. And this shows a pretty, a very good comparison, actually. If you look at Be um, Betelgeist, the Pleiades, Saturn, Aldebaran, as well as Orion. And according to this, these Akkadian representations are not realistic, but only systematic. Even so, the astronomical order is right. The planets on the elliptical trajectory passes between Betelgeuse and the Aldebaran and the Pleiades. I like to call that star Betelgeuse. I prefer to call it Betelgeuse, but I probably got the other name wrong too. I don't care. Well, I do a little bit. If I got it wrong, let me know and I'll get it right next time. Thanks. So uh, yeah, what do you think about that? Hello. That's what I'm talking about. Now, does it make more sense that this ancient cuneiform tablet is going to depict the stars like that or the planets? I don't know, man. It's wild, right? It's a journey. We're finding it together. I think there could be a 10th. There was a 10th planet. That's, that's my take on these Sumerian accounts. Now, whether or not it's going to come back next year or in 100 years or 200 years, I don't know. I don't know. Because if this thing came by, and if, the more we're learning about the universe being electric and these currents the way that they flow through the universe and how planets are magnetically charged. So they'll, they won't necessarily hit each other, but there could be an arc of electricity that goes from planet A to planet B or from planet X to planet Z. Hello. So there's a lot of evidence for there being catastrophic events in our solar system in the past. Science is confirming these scriptures. So if this thing did a flyby X amount of years ago, would it even have the same trajectory now? I don't think so. I think it would be far different. And also, Planet Nine that they still haven't shown us an image of seems to have some of these characteristics minus the 3,600-year orbit because it's showing an orbit of about 10 to 20,000 years. With that being said, could this have been the original Planet X that got launched into this orbit that is now much farther out than it was previously because the planets changed? It'd be neat if we could have some virtual reality programs and, and do some deep learning algos to be able to, to show us a computer model of how all these tablets would translate into planetary alignments if we could link a specific name to a particular planet and then we could put in the constellations and the zodiacs and all the information we have we put it into a computer and then we get the computer to decipher 
the names uh, based upon, you know, if that specific name is being referenced as a, as a god, which is a planet, then where was that planet at that particular time? That could give some pretty remarkable, remarkable results, in my opinion. But do you have any questions that I might be able to answer for you before, before I close this podcast out? And thanks a lot for being here with me. Yes, the glasses are to protect my eyes from, from blue light because I'm on the computer a lot and you can see it, how it reflects the blue light. It's good for my eyes. Now, here's, here's another very interesting thing. If this, the Sumerian stuff, I'm able to take back about 280 plus thousand years, right? You go to the Sumerian king list and you, and you read through these caches of tablets that have been discovered and translated. A lot of them are on Oxford University's website. It specifically titles names that are linked to the Sumerian king list that I've been able to date back over 28,000 years. Um, so with that being said, the Sumerian king list, though, however, however you can take back about 300,000 years. So if we go back 300,000 years and connect those with some of the, the mines in South Africa that seem to be about the same age, what happened before then? We're taught that caveman was very ignorant, didn't have much knowledge. You know, was walking around, didn't even know how to start a fire, let alone a, a will. What if cavemen were superior in knowledge that had the ability to perform what we would look at as like magical feats because of their DNA? And then something happened. So now we've been suppressed since then. That's kind of what I'm starting to, I want to find out now because I can figure out stuff going back about 300,000 years. What was before then? That's the next step. Thanks for being here. Hit the subscribe, hit the bell, be well, stay alive, hit the subscribe and be the change you want to see.